Sup y'all, it's time for The Shining Part 7, the last video of this unit. We'll take a look at how everything comes together in the American Revolution. It was the predictable product of North American nationalism, where the colonists began to see each other as a separate nation from England. It was also influenced by Anglo-authoritarianism, referring to the way that England attempted to force the colonists to remain within the English Empire, even though many Americans leaned toward independence. And of course, these events were inspired by the ideas and lessons that emerged out of the European Enlightenment. Now, to explain how the Americans began to see themselves as Americans, and not simply British subjects, we have to go back in time a little bit. Queen Anne has the dubious distinction of ruling as the last of the Stuart monarchs. She died in 1714 without any living heir to the throne, although it was not for a lack of trying, Throughout her life, she was pregnant 17 times and only had five live births. Nonetheless, none of her children outlived her. So, the throne of England passed on to her second cousin, George I, a German from the House of Hanover. Nonetheless, he and his successor, George II, barely spoke English at all and often spent more time away from England than presiding from within it. As a result, the country increasingly looked to the prime minister from within the House of Commons and this was done to run the day-to-day -day operations for the government. Later on, George III, on the other hand, was born and raised in England, and attempted to increase his power. He reigned during the time of the Seven Years' War, which is known as the French and Indian War in North America. The Seven Years' War was in many ways a world war that pit the great powers of Europe against each other. Through most of the years, you had France, Austria, and Russia against Britain and Prussia, by the end of the war, in 1763, the French turned out to be the biggest loser, giving up practically all their holdings of land in the Americas, only retaining some small fishing grounds in the Northeast. Now, colonial governments reflect the systems of their mother countries. For instance, the only colonies in the New World that had representative assemblies were the English colonies. This is due to the fact that England was a limited constitutional monarchy and all English subjects expected to be represented by Parliament. To help pay for the war, and to cover for some of the cost of maintaining a garrison of thousands of British troops in the colonies, basically to prevent any French invasion, the American colonists had several taxes imposed on them, for example, a stamp tax that was placed on many items. Even though the colonists paid lower taxes than British subjects in England, it infuriated them. Now, many Americans saw themselves as a new nation, in part due to the fact that many of them had fought together in colonial militias during the Seven Years' War. So New Yorkers, Virginians, and other colonists saw that they had much more in common than they had once thought. They were mostly the same race, with the same Protestant religion, and due to distance decay from England, they saw their mother country as an oppressive regime. Inspired by Enlightenment thinking, colonial leaders decried the possibility that they could be taxed without a single colonial representative in Parliament. Despite the Crown's insistence that Parliament represented all British subjects, the Stamp Act was eventually repealed to prevent a rebellion. Other taxes and acts were passed and later repealed due to similar complaints. However, one did remain, and that was a tax on tea. And the only tea that was legal to purchase in the colonies would be provided by the British East India Company. Now, even though the price of tea went down, which it did, it represented an act of tyranny to the colonists, since they had no say in the law's passage. Rebelling against this act, many colonists, dressed up as Indians, threw hundreds of crates of tea overboard at the Boston Tea Party, resulting in even more intolerable acts. Now, to use an analogy, imagine if you went to the beach and you grabbed a handful of sand, and you hold it just loosely, well, then most of the sand basically stays there. But once you tighten your grip, the more that the sands fall through your fingers, and that's mostly what happened with the King of England, George III, the more he tightened his grip, the more the colonies slipped through his fingers. Now, for a simple yet unscientific formula, here we go. Mercantilism and the ideas of the Enlightenment resulted in capitalism. So here's a little bit of a chart to illustrate to you how they actually differ. Mercantilism thrives under monarchies, whereas capitalism tends to thrive under popular sovereignty. 
or democracies. Under mercantilism, you're talking about a great deal of governmental control, whereas under capitalism, you're talking about the ideas of laissez-faire. Under mercantilism, you're dealing with monopolies, such as the British East India Company, and under capitalism, you're talking about open competition. Mercantilism, you're dealing with tariffs and subsidies to control those monopolies and support them, whereas under capitalism, you're talking about the promotion of free trade. And ultimately, under mercantilism, you know you've won if you go out there and receive the most gold. In capitalism, you know you've won if you go out there and you produce the most goods. So you can really see kind of a contrast about knowing what mercantilism is and what capitalism is, but knowing also what they are not. Now, to better understand capitalism, we need to consult one of the most influential economic thinkers of any era, the Scottish philosopher Adam Smith, known as the father of classical economics. He wrote The Wealth of Nations quite apropos in 1776, in which he espoused the virtues of capitalism, even though he never actually used the term. He contended that natural laws governed economics. Most notably, he stated that buyers and sellers are interested in keeping as much property as they can. This is the law of supply and demand. Essentially, when demand exceeds supply, prices go up. When the supply exceeds demand, prices go down. In the market, which is the world of buyers and sellers, if items are more scarce, they tend to be more valuable. Furthermore, he argued against monopolies that were often propped up by the government, such as the British East India Company. Monopolies could raise prices because they had no real competition. So, in essence, he argued in favor of the self-regulating behavior of the marketplace in a free enterprise system. Now, enterprise refers to private businesses. In other words, because buyers and sellers act in their own self-interest, an equilibrium would be achieved. He said it was as if an invisible hand was guiding the prices exactly where they needed to be. The best approach was laissez-faire, meaning let do, or hands off, without government intervention. Over time, prices would decrease due to competition. The quality of products and life would increase, as well as the public welfare. These economic ideals had already been utilized by a nation of people in another hemisphere, the Americans. As we've seen before, one of the main goals of the study of history is to understand why events occurred as they did. Think about the connections starting from Copernicus's theory and his continued defense, which kicked off the Age of Reason, encompassing the scientific revolution and merging into the Enlightenment, leading into an era of enlightened despots and finally culminating with the American Revolution. Had the works of Copernicus never been published, the works of T. Paine invariably would never have been written. No, not that one. This one. Thomas Paine. In his pamphlet, Common Sense, and in clear, simple language, he explained the advantages of, and the need for, immediate independence. Just listen to how his words connected all the way back to Copernicus. There is something very absurd in supposing a continent to be perpetually governed by an island. In no instance hath nature made the satellite larger than its primary planet, and as England and America, with respect to each other, reverses the common order of nature, it is evident they belong to different systems, England to Europe, America to itself. Inspired by Enlightenment thinking and capitalist ideals, a group of individuals acting according to the self-interest of their nation met in Philadelphia and released a work of their own in 1776, the Declaration of Independence. It was drafted mostly by Thomas Jefferson, who borrowed heavily from writers such as John Locke, who had explained that when a government becomes tyrannical, the people have the right to overthrow that government and create one of their own choosing. So the first shot of the American Revolution sent ripples around the world. This was a political revolution, pitting an American democracy against the British monarchy. And it was also an economic revolution, pitting the desire of American capitalism against the control of British mercantilism. Colonial leaders such as Benjamin Franklin implored the colonists to unite behind the cause of freedom, which most did. As the war raged, the Americans found allies in countries like France, who were more eager to help the Americans to maintain a balance of power in Europe. Besides, the French also sought to revenge their loss in the Seven Years' War. And do not forget that it was France, after all, that truly began the Enlightenment. And by 1783, 
the Americans won their independence from England. This painting shows the signing of the Treaty of Paris that formally ended the war. It remained unfinished because the British officers were so upset and so embarrassed for losing to the Americans that they refused to pose. After the unsuccessful Articles of Confederation, the United States created a new constitution in 1787. Inspired by the Enlightenment thinkers such as Montesquieu, Voltaire, and Rousseau, amongst others, they established a federal republic and not a pure democracy. Now, in a federal republic, the people elect representatives whom they can vote out of office if they choose. So, the United States was the first democratically established country built from the ground up. But of course, we all have to ask ourselves this very important question. Would any of this have happened if it wasn't for... the plow? Here's Johnny!